Uh, we're going to also talk about what kind of records you need to keep and what it means to have income versus expenses versus appreciable assets. Okay, Lisa, that's battle, 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 right? <laughs> Um, and uh, then if we have time, we're going to talk also about the difference between a hobby and, uh, and a business. Since I've already defined a business, anybody got an idea what a hobby means? Not, not expecting a profit? Not expecting a profit! Right! So exactly the same equipment, exactly the same process, exactly the same thing that is at the end, painting, or, or a beautiful shirt, or a piece of a, a good chair, chair, okay, <laughs> um, comes out at the end, but if your intention is not to make profit, then you have a hobby. And if you have a hobby, you do not do anything at all with your taxes. You just enjoy it for the sake of its beauty, all right? Uh, then if we have extra, extra time, we're going to talk about 1099s and W9s because that's a big thing right now. Everybody understand that 1099s are due on January 31st? Okay. And if you are in business for yourself, then you may need to file, file 1099s for somebody that you hired. So we'll talk about that briefly. All right. So the IRS says that if you are in business, we were talked about what business means, right? Uh, and you are the only one that owns that business, then you are a sole proprietor, assuming that you are unincorporated, okay? Everybody knows that uh, Walmart is a big corporation, right? Uh, Lisa Sertanovich, LLC is I just own my own company, right? And it's just me. And uh, as long as I am also not a corporation, right, then I am a sole proprietor. The words sole proprietor and independent contractor, they are synonymous. They equal the same thing. They mean exactly the same thing from the IRS's eyes. Okay, so if, if someone asks you, are you an independent contractor? And you can say, I own my own company, I am in business for myself, then the answer would be yes, I'm an independent contractor. I'm also a sole proprietor, right? So uh, if you look at things on the IRS website, because you guys do that every day, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. Um, they really are the same thing, okay? Uh, the, the only words that are, are a little bit describing them, uh, the independent contractor has the right to be able to say, this is the way I'm going to do it, right? As opposed to an employee where the employer says, this is the way that you have to do it. So that's the difference between the two, all right? Uh, it's, it can be a fuzzy line a little bit, um, but uh, look, one of the big things that uh, an independent contractor versus an employee uh, would be is, as an independent contractor, most likely, no, no, definitely, I have more than one customer, okay? So now I might have one customer at a time because I am a painter and I'm doing this giant mural on the side of a 12-story building, right? And it's gonna take me 18 months to complete it. So during that 18 months, I may only have that one client Right? But after that project is over, I'm going to go find another building to do with another client. Right, And so even though I may only have one client at a time, one customer at a time, uh, <laughs> um, as long as I'm the one that's in control of, of the work, then I'm the independent contractor. It's important that you make that distinction. Uh, especially when it comes to um, things like 
if your customer decides that you should part ways and uh, uh, you say, okay, well, I'm gonna go file for unemployment. As an independent contractor, you don't qualify for unemployment, okay? Because that's for employees. Employment, employees, unemployment. Okay, <laughs> so that's, that's a big thing right there, okay? Uh, the advantage of you being an independent contractor is you get to say when and where and how and why, and it's, it's my project, and uh, um, I get to charge you, and, and I get to take tax deductions that an employee would not get to take, right? Now, if I've got a partner that's helping me run the business and they own the part of the business, then you're no longer a sole proprietor. Sole meaning singular, plus one, right? And so uh, if you have a partnership, then you actually have to file a separate tax return. You still get a lot of the same tax deductions, um, things like mileage and cell phones and business cards, right? So you still get a lot of the same deductions, but it's on a separate tax return that you and your partner have to kind of split up at the end, right? So who here is in a partnership? Yes! Okay, one, <laughs> two partners. Okay, um, the, the crux of this discussion is gonna focus a lot just on the sole proprietor. Uh, for, the, for the partnership, most of the deductions are exactly the same. It's just you will file a separate tax return. Uh, a independent contractor files their regular 1040 personal tax return but with a Schedule C. So it's just an extra page in the whole tax return. A Schedule C? Schedule C is in CAT, or COIN. Uh, so you file your regular 1040 tax return. That's just your uh, personal tax return that you would file if you had a W-2 job. Um, and you file an additional page Called a Schedule C. If you're a partner. Oh, and a partnership? Oh, oh a partnership. That's, that's it. That's a sole proprietor, independent contractor. Partnerships file Form 1065, 1065. If it is an S corporation, it would file an 1120-S. And a C corporation files an 1120. It's a nonprofit organization. That's an Form 990, I could go on, <laughs> right? If you're a solo LLC, it's still a Schedule C because you can afford you, right? That is correct, and that's an excellent question, which was where I was gonna go next, see? Okay. Great segue. Um, who here has a limited liability company, an LLC? Quite a few, quite a few people, right? As long as you are the only owner, then you are also a sole proprietor independent contractor. The limited liability company, LLC portion of that is uh, only to protect you from a legal side of things, all right? From a tax side, you just do the same thing as you would as if you did not have an LLC. Is everybody following me there? Yes. Which one goes first when you file the LLC? Do that one first and then your 1040? Okay, so a limited liability company, if you are the only owner of that limited liability company, you are still a sole proprietor, independent contractor, and therefore you only file the 1040 with the Schedule C. Just as though you didn't have the LLC. The LLC gives you the protection the legal protection. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give you legal advice, right, on, on what the legal side of a, a limited liability company does, 
but just by its name, it limits your exposure to liabilities. <laughs> um, uh, so um, it helps protect your personal assets, right? All of your hard-earned money, right? But from a tax perspective, there's no difference between a, a limited liability company that's owned by just one person and somebody who doesn't have a limited liability company uh, but is a sole proprietor. You still just file tax form 1040, your personal tax return, with the Schedule C. Uh, super. What's the Schedule C again for? Schedule C is when you are a sole proprietor. And so what it says is, this is my income, these are all my expenses, this is the profit I made, and then I'm gonna pay taxes on that profit. So it lists out your income, your expenses, and your profit. Schedule C does that. Schedule C. Mm -hmm. Which is why you wanna keep your accounting records, all of the stuff that you do on a daily basis, you wanna keep that up to date. <coughs> Not just for your tax return, but that's a pretty important reason why, right? Uh, so we just talked a little bit about income, right? Being at the at the top of the Schedule C, it's going to ask you the very first, I mean, very first line, almost the first line says, "How much sales did you have?" Right? And uh, sales, by definition, are income. All right, that's any money coming in for a product or service that you have provided or sold, all right? That can mean cash. People can give you cash. If they give you cash, you still have to count that as income and report it on your Schedule C. Does the IRS know about it? No, probably not, not unless you, from that one uh, person, uh, charge them more than $600. But uh, you're still required by the IRS to report that money. Yes, ma'am. Um, if part of my invoice <clears throat> is for services rendered and then the other part is for like the supplies, yes, that supply <laughs> portion is not income, correct? It's income. Okay. Okay. Follow me here. All right. If you just said. What do you do? Uh, I'm in fashion. Okay, in fashion. Uh huh. And so uh, you're going to create for Lisa a beautiful ball gown for the uh, award ceremony that I'm going to get for doing this presentation. All right. <laughs> um, and uh, you're you're going to charge me a thousand dollars for this for this ball gown. In that thousand dollars. Yes, there is material and thread and dye and buttons and zippers and sequins, because it's fancy, right? Um, and all of that material, right? But you're still gonna charge me $1,000, all right? For the whole thing. The, the material then would be expenses. Okay, okay so your profit which is the most important word out of the whole night. Everybody say it with me. Profit. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the most important word is profit. Okay? The profit is the difference between that thousand dollars minus those materials and your time, right? That gives you your profit. Okay? Uh, on the income side, I, I do want to reiterate that it's cash, even under the table, cash you're supposed to report, uh, credit cards, checks, Bitcoin, even if, uh, okay, for this ball gown, right, I'm gonna uh, exchange uh, four hours worth of tax return help, right, for this ball gown. Uh, that would be a barter situation, and both of us would have to count that as income. The expense, however, would be that you sold a gown with all that material and I sold my services 
on my end, right? And as it turns out, because I'm selling it to you for $1,000, my expenses are $1,000, and my net profit is 1,000 minus 1,000 is nothing, right? So most barter situations end up netting to zero. All right? But they still have to be reported. Yes. So you would still count it as income. I would still say that I had four hours of accounting services uh, rendered, and then I had an expense of $1,000. Right, so, and she would report $1,000 for a gallon <coughs> sold and $1,000 worth of uh, CPA work. So a barter situation, you still have to report it. Most of the time, you would do it because it evens out, right? And so the net effect on your profit is zero, right? Um, but having said that, I want to imagine the scenario of the person that you're doing the barter with and we both agree, it's not reported, it's just kind of this barter, we're keeping it between ourselves so we don't have to make away on the table. get away with that, right? Mm, okay, I'm going to give you the same answer that, that's uh, about the cash. The answer is you are required to report it. All right? <laughs> uh, if you don't, and the IRS somehow or another finds out about it, uh, then they could assess fines and penalties for you under reporting your income. Right. Now, of course, they would have to find it, they would have to prove it, and, you know, it is that a lot of work that the IRS may not want to deal with, right? Maybe, maybe, but the IRS is becoming more and more sophisticated, guys. They really are. Uh, Ten years ago, I wouldn't have worried about it so much. Nowadays, the, the programs that they have that can dig into uh, how you're reporting your taxes and what kind of income you have, what kind of lifestyle you have, they can cross-reference a bunch of things, right? So um, just be aware that, that they're becoming much more aggressive now. On the expense side, uh, we talked a, lot, a, a bit about materials, right? And most, uh, most artists, especially those that have a tangible product that they sell, right, um, they understand the material side of it. But let's think about a, a, a dancer, right? Um, you, don't, you don't have any, uh, well, you have some materials that you buy, right? I'm sure that you have to have uh, a, a costume or an outfit that you perform in, right? But uh, your, your materials are gonna be really, really small. So you wanna focus uh, your attention on the other type of tax deductions that you can take, on the other expenses that you incur because you are in business, all right? So if you are in business, one of the, one of the really big things aside from profit that you might want to take away from tonight is thinking about yourself as a real business and that's because you have a motive of being a, a profit, right? Uh, but in order to not be seen as a hobby, you want to make sure that you have a lot of things in order, okay? Um, and that way you can legitimately take all the rest of these types of expenses that we'll get to in just a second, but I want to throw out some ideas of what it, what the IRS thinks about when they start thinking about are you truly in business, right? Uh, if I walked up to you and said, hey, I'm a singer, you would laugh at me, <laughs> but um, uh, you would say, uh, okay, right? Do you have a website? Uh -huh, a website, right. Do you have a 
performance calendar? Business card. Business card, performance calendar, right? So things that show to the outside world, right, that you are legitimately in business, okay? Uh, another thing that the IRS really heavily relies on is a budget, okay? So if you've got a budget, if you've got a website, if you present yourself as though you are a business, right, then it really, really solidifies the fact that you are, right? A budget shows them uh, that you have a profit motive because a budget says, this is what I think my expenses are gonna be, this is what I think my, my income is gonna be, and therefore I'm trying to get more income than, than I have expenses in order to make a profit, yeah? So, uh, the other thing that you really want to have is two different bank accounts. Okay, I got a lot of nods there. Excellent, right? So uh, this is a, a very technical term, but commingling of funds, meaning that I, if I was at a, okay, my husband is a musician, and he goes and he plays his guitar at, uh, at an event. So he went to a gig, he got 500 bucks. If he brings that $500 and on his way home, he stops and fills up the car and buys the groceries and, uh, you know, buys me flowers. Um, all that's really nice, but before he did that, he needed to deposit that $500 into the business bank account and then withdraw $500 in order to do all of these honeydew things. And he really is that nice. <laughs> um, but uh, so you need to make sure that you don't pay your rent out of the same bank account that you have your money, your income coming into, okay? You don't buy groceries, you don't pay for your gas. This is maybe a nifty question, but if like I get paid via PayPal, PayPal is connected to my personal account. Can I just put it in my personal account and then transfer it to my business account? Yes, cool. and then transfer it back. Oh, you well, can pay your rent. Sure, okay, <laughs> yeah. But, I, but doing the steps yeah. still counts. Okay. That's fine. As long as it ends up there so yeah. that you can say, the money ended up there, the income is there, and then I dispersed it back to myself. Yes. And when you spoke about rent, if you have a business use for your home or part of your home, uh -huh. does that get confused? Or does part of the rent come from your business account? Uh, no, it does not. Uh, I can go over that now if you, okay, we got a lot of, yes, okay. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit all of these, we'll come back to rent, all right? So mileage, uh, in 2019, it's 58 cents a mile. In 2020, they dropped it back to 57.5, right? So half a cent they dropped. Um, you can still deduct your health insurance premium. If you have interest on a loan or credit cards, you can still deduct that. Remember that if you're gonna use a, comp a credit card, it needs to be in your company's name, all right? Uh, in addition to the separation of funds, right? No commingling of funds. Uh, it also helps establish your business credit rating, all right, if you have a separate credit card. Um, if you have legal or professional dues, like uh, if you're a member of TALA, right? Those dues are, are an expense in order to run your business properly as an artist, right? I'm gonna skip rent, we'll go back to it. Uh, meals, if you are out on the road as an artist, uh, if you, let's say that, that you had to go all the way up to Lakeway to see Lisa at her next uh, coffee house event, about uh, once a quarter I do talks similar to this about a business topic, and you buy a cup of coffee out there. Because you're not, you had to go there and it was an event, you could write that cup of coffee off. But it's only 50% deductible, right? Uh, IRS says, eh, you're human. Everybody has to eat. 
And so uh, we're not going to give you a full deduction on it. You're only going to get 50% deduction for business because you had to eat regardless of whether or not it was business. Right. So the same 50% also applies to like a cell phone bill, right? No, no. The cell phone bill is uh, you have to allocate how much of your cell phone bill is for personal and how much of it's for business. And in my case, how much of it is for my CPA business? How much is it for the recording studio business? How much is it for the uh, property investment business? How much is it for the we have like six or eight businesses, right? So my one cell phone bill gets allocated to each of those. If you have a reasonable allocation process, then the IRS will accept it. Uh, if you only have one business, uh, sorry, you know, just one, uh, don't allocate more than 50%, especially now that we can do everything on our cell phone right? Uh, the IRS knows that you're doing personal stuff on, on that phone. What if you have a separate phone? So if you have a completely just... separate phone that is on a separate plan and it's a separate, 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 and you pay for it with your business funds, okay, then yes, you can, you can uh, claim that whole thing 100%. But that's very unusual for us nowadays to have more than one device. If you do, uh, more power to you. <laughs> uh, I'm lazy, I can barely carry along one thing. So I use an app that has telephone, different telephone numbers coming to the same, te same device. Do you share the name of that app? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, team. My wife uses it. She's a photographer. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh. There's, there's two or three apps. I'll, um, can somebody take that note so I can make sure that um, I, uh, I get that by the end? Yes. Can you, when I register then, uh, just speak to the point of mileage in Okay, absolutely. Uh, so this business use of your home, uh, we're gonna we're talk, so rent, that rent is if you office or have a studio out of a separate place other than your primary residence, okay? And you pay rent for that, uh, then that rent is 100% deductible, but you better pay it out of the company bank account, okay? <clears throat> if you have a portion of your personal residence, doesn't matter whether you own the home or you rent an apartment or you rent a room from somebody, um, if uh, you have a dedicated area that is used only for your business. So not your dining room table that you, you know, are eating your cornflakes and, okay, your oat bran, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and at the same time over here, there's a, you know, your, your project that you're working on, right? No, it can't be that. It has to be, at, it has to be dedicated, right, for your work. So let's say that you um, do pottery and uh, in, you know, you've got a detached two-car garage that you've turned into your studio, right? So that whole two-car garage, 600 square feet, could be claimed as uh, your home office, okay? Because it's dedicated, right? It can be as small as a desk over here in this corner, and this is one, two, three, four, by three, 12 square feet, okay? Uh, and I'm renting a room from, uh, you know, from my parents, right? That 12 square feet, if it were me, I would recommend that you use the simplified version, multiply that 12 feet by $5, that's your deduction for the year, okay? 
you can take up to 300 square feet using this simplified version. And you don't have to keep any receipts. You just have to prove that it's a dedicated space. All right? Um, if you do the detailed version of the dedicated space, Let's think about that two-car garage that's 600 square feet. That's more than 300, right? <coughs> then uh, you would want to keep receipts for any repairs and maintenance that you do on the house, any, um, if, if the electricity bill in there is on the same circuit as the rest of the house, then you might want to divide up your electric bill based on square footage, uh, your water bill, your, um, cable bill, I mean, you know, a bunch of things, right? Uh, allocating it based on square footage is one of the most common ways to allocate. It, you know, there's other methodologies though, um, because if, uh, if this is 600 square feet and my house is only 250, because it's, it's a tiny little house, right? For those cute little things. Um, uh, then it might be disproportionate, right? Because really I use most of my electricity over there and not over here because I'm, you know, I don't ever air condition this, right? Um, but uh, anything that's reasonable, square footage is the most common, right? But if you, if you use this detailed uh, version, you have to keep copies of the receipts. Um, I will, Note that electronic copies of receipts are fine now. So a PDF, a JPEG, on your phone, right? You don't have to keep the paper, but you do have to have a receipt. Yes? What if you don't have receipts for your rent? Or how would you... Well, you have... Uh, I would say that you most likely have a, a rental agreement with the apartment or your landlord. And you could use that. Uh, if you don't, then hopefully you at least have a canceled check that you wrote to that person if you're paying them cash. I would say maybe go to them and see if you can't get them to sign a little thing that they received, you know, $400 from you this month and at least you've got something, right? Uh, really, it's more that good faith, I'm trying to prove to you, Mr. IRS Auditor, that I'm doing the right thing. Would a notarized document work? Or no? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. From the renter. From the, or uh, landlord. Landlord. Okay. Yeah. If you do simplify, you don't have to keep, you don't also deduct your bills. You, you cannot. You cannot. You can no, only do one or the right. other. Uh-huh. So what, what was the formula again? Five dollars per square foot, and that's for the whole year. So there's a max of uh, fifteen hundred dollars. Um, yeah, if you're purchasing uh, jewelry or any machines off of Craigslist, yes. Um, how do you go about doing receipts? Uh huh. Receipts for that. So uh, what I've started to do because uh, my husband loves Craigslist. Right? So what I make him do is when he, uh, you know, on Craigslist you have a little reply button um, and it allows you to send an email or text or something, right? I really try and get him to send an email with uh, a link to the, to the exact page in Craigslist so that it comes up with the item in a pic, you know, because you know, almost everybody has pictures, right? Um, so uh, that it's detailed out what it was that you bought, right? And uh, then I would save that email as a PDF so that I've got a receipt of, in effect. So essentially like a screenshot? Would be a screenshot would be perfect. Okay. Perfect, right? Um, if you have your own house, can you deduct a portion of your property taxes? So you can deduct a portion of your property taxes if you do the detailed uh, <coughs> methodology. 
So like if your studio is 10% of the size of your little house, then you can mm -hmm. take 10% of the property. of the property tax. Mm -hmm. But you can't do both as you point out, you can't do the so just uh, let's say like in Europe, uh, let's say we went through a divorce and you did in four different rich last year, you kind of screw right in terms of all the math you have to do? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The accounting for that would be uh, difficult. And if it were me, uh, unless you've got a really big space in each of those four residences, I would do the $5 a square foot methodology, at least for that year just in order to not have to try and dig through all the paperwork and call up the ex and say, hey, do you have a receipt for this? And you know, it's just, it, it would be a lot of, administratively, I think it would be more work than it would be worth unless the space is huge. Is it a separate form for the simplified? Uh, no. It just goes in Schedule C? Yes. Well, I have a little question. As far as like, uh, and I buy a lot of art books for reference, that can count as a deduction, right? Yes. Now, unless I'm a DJ, you can do that with vinyls, right? You can do that with vinyls because it's research. Can you still do that? Yes. Uh, of course, it depends on what your business is, right? So, if I'm a CPA, right? and I start buying a lot of vinyl, and I start counting it as a business deduction, the IRS is gonna wonder what I'm doing, right? Because as a CPA, I don't need a collection of vinyls to do my business, right? Unless I happen to be a CPA that specializes, right, in the production of vinyl records. Okay, if that was the case, it might be uh, important, like critically important for my business to understand how vinyl is, is manufactured, how it's processed, how, you know, the whole thing. Right. So it depends on your business, the, the real answer. And the, the, the real answer to almost any expenditure is, is this necessary for my business? If it's necessary for your business, uh, then it's a deductible expense. Other things like advertising, right? I mean, you gotta get customers, you gotta get clients, right? So Facebook ads, um, uh, flyers, business cards, right? Um, Education, so, um, you know, if uh, if you came to Lisa Stratenovich CPA and you wanted to take her business coaching class, right, then uh, that expense would be a deduction for your business, right? Um, repairs, so if you've got a, uh, if you're a photographer and you've got a camera and the lens breaks, the replacement of that, uh, or repair of that lens would be a deduction. Uh, your bank fees, any licenses that you might need, right? Um, so again, if the expense is used for both you and, uh, you personally and your business, then there has to be some sort of reasonable allocation. Yes? What about some yoga teachers, they, they So the question of, uh, of uniforms uh, is pretty specific and IRS is getting really, really narrow on that. Um, uh, if you have a business, let's say you're a plumber, right? And in order to walk up to somebody's house, you want to make sure that your uniform says Joe's plumbing service on it so that they're not scared to open the door, right? Um, and you want all of your uh, staff to have the same 
look and feel because you're very passionate about being a creative plumber. <laughs> and um, so uh, you want all of your stuff to have the same uniform. It's all a white shirt, Joe's creative plumbing on it, and khaki pants, right? Everybody has to wear that every day that they work for you, right? That's a uniform. Can you go to Walmart wearing Joe's, you know? Of course you can, right? But you wouldn't normally put it on that attire to go to Walmart or go to, you know, the opera, right? So uh, if you are a yoga instructor and the place where you're instructing at has a uniform that they have you wear, then that is a deduction. But if you are a yoga instructor and you just want to wear yoga clothes, it's not going to count. The, uh, the dancer uh, it, it's a little bit different because they can't perform without a particular outfit, right? A particular thing. Um, but for the most part, uh, you're like, I have to dress somewhat professionally anyways, and I don't get to take any deduction for any of my clothes. It really sucks, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, so the answer there is, on uh, the yoga clothes, probably not. What about something like steel toed boots for a construction site? Like your painting a mural? No. Nope. Even if it's required by the company that's hiring you as a sole proprietor? That would be that would, like if it's in the contract, right? right. Like, so like, no, that. And, uh, and steel toed boots or something? Yeah. Like that? No, that would qualify as a uniform. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, and maybe, right, in order to say fit stay safe, mm -hmm. it could be kind of part of the material. Yeah, it's like kind of safety equipment as well as... Right, like, right, right. You know, garments or whatever. Garments, right. So, so I, I just find that this beautiful white jacket that I want to use for painting, you know, I put my logo on it on the back, like it kind of doesn't make sense. Yes. So I have all these buttons and advertising that it's put to so specific to me. Correct. And see, that would swap over into advertising. So, if you want your yoga clothes, right, to be deductible, start embroidering them, right, with your logo, right, and then all of a sudden now your normal yoga clothes are are advertising. You can buy them to the boots, right? You can do that too. <laughs> I have a specific question about supplies. Um, as an artist, you collect supplies over the years and then as you're starting to you know build your business you're using the supplies that you bought for several years are you allowed to like do deductions for things that you purchased even like 10 years ago or five years ago or okay so uh when we purchased that mm -hmm. it was a deduction in that year gotcha all right so you already took that deduction five years ago gotcha on your tax return okay. All right. But anything purchased in, in, in 2019 yeah. would get deducted in 2019. Okay. Um, uh, let me talk about mileage real quick uh, before I jump to the next topic. Um, so with mileage, if, who here has a studio? Who here has a studio that is not in their house? Okay, a couple people. When you go from your house to that studio, that is not deductible miles. If you go from that studio to a client, you get to deduct miles. After that, you have to say what day it happened, where you were going, why that was a business trip, and how many miles you went. By studio, do you mean home office as well? Same, same, not same. Same. Okay. Studio, office, Place of work. I have to go from my apartment to my, the post office that's, five times a week. That's deductible. All right. As long as you keep track of it, you have to have another. Track an app or something. I've seen yes. that. Yes. My OIQ is a great one. I remember that app. 
right? Um, Mile IQ, uh, if you have QuickBooks Online, uh, uh, Mile IQ is included now in your subscription. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. You can be super old fashioned and keep a little notebook, right? Um, on January 1st of every year, through the fog of the hangover, you go out to your car, write down the beginning mileage. Okay, that's the very first thing I want you to do on January 1st. You are going to remember me on January 1st, okay, of this coming year. Go out, write down the mileage, all right? Because you have to, uh, on the tax return, you have to put beginning mileage and ending mileage, all right? Um, yes? This silly question. If you're going from the studio to buy some materials, that's deductible, right? That's a business purpose, okay. right? Going from your home to the place of work that is a consistent place of work, right? And and vice versa, right? Is not deductible. That's called a commute. Everybody here is familiar with that word, right? <laughs> In Austin. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, the commute is not deductible. But just about any other business use of your personal car is deductible, okay? Coming to the Doherty Art Center tonight, counted. Who all wrote that down? <laughs> Yay! Kudos. <laughs> um, right? Uh, and going back in time won't work. Okay, you've got to keep it IRS word contemporaneous, right? Meaning as it's occurring, you have to keep those records. All right, so the apps are fantastic. Um, again, if, if the app is, you know, if you're not a techie person, uh, just keep a little notebook in your car, write down the day, how many miles it was, where you were going, and why it was business. I went to this client site, uh, you know, on January the 28th, and it was 17 miles. And then I went from there to Walmart to pick up some supplies. And then I went from Walmart to uh, here for a class, right? And then I went home. The then I went home still counts because you didn't go from your studio to your home, right? Is everybody clear now on mileage? So therefore, you have to write what mileage your car is at? On January 1. On January 1st, you have to have a beginning mileage. And for that matter, the 31st, you have to have ending mileage. But if you do it every January 1st, through the fog of your hangover, right? Uh, then, then uh, you'll have beginning and ending at the same time. So if I didn't write it down at the beginning of this year, do it right now. Okay, I would go right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> when you get out of this class. So the say, for example, I have family in El Paso, and I don't know if we can travel there as well. Yes. And is it the long, like 670 something miles for sound, right? But once I'm over there, you have to have to do the mass. Right. Once you're over there, if you're splitting it between personal and business, you have to make an allocation. Right, so if you're, what is it, uh, 1,200 miles? No, 800 miles. So, so from here-ish. Uh, so it'd be 800 one way, right? And then while you were there, you saw your brother and your cousin and your cousin wife and their kids and, and you know. Lots of people that say that if I stop in Bobo Ray, I make a quick dash tomorrow just for fun and games, you don't count that out. So. Can't count it, because fun and games is not business. <laughs> now, follow me here, right? If you're wearing that white jacket with the embroidery on the back, all of a sudden that's a marketing excursion. <laughs> that's deductible. So what if, what if I have a bag that's painted with a little bit of everything on the side? Uh, yeah, it counts, but you can't count it everywhere. The IRS understands that you're going to use that for some personal use also. So it can't be a permanent, 
you know, right. advertising venture everywhere, right? Yes? Now, the visual artist is going to market could be considered research or... Oh, absolutely. So, I have to go out there every month. Oh, darn. <laughs> you know? And by chance, you know, that cute little girl that you've been seeing happens to live out there, you know? Uh, you know, can't help but stop and, you know, have dinner. You know, have to eat. Right? Um, and by the way, she brought her neighbor along and we talked about visual art. So guess what? Now that whole meal is 50% deductible as long as you pay for it. But if you're in Austin and you've talked about your business at dinner, it doesn't count. It does count. Oh. I thought it was only traffic, so we're gonna have to okay. So there is something called a tax home, and if you go out of your tax home, right, then uh, then that's 50% deductible, right? If you are in your tax home, then you have to have a business purpose for that meal, right? So again, okay, so this is, okay, we, we talked about what kind of things you needed to have on your contemporaneous log for your mileage for your meals, on the receipt, what I do anyways, on the receipt, uh, as soon as I do the tip, right, I write down Lisa, that's me, I was there, right, uh, and Lee, right, and we talk about CPA stuff, right, it's already got the date, it's already got the amount, right, and the place, by the way, right, and so now that whole receipt, 50% deductible. If you've got something like QuickBooks Online or Xero, you take a picture of it, it gets uploaded to your accounting records immediately, and then you crunch that and, and eat it. No, don't eat it. <laughs> you know, you can, you can destroy it then. All right, you must put down who, well, the receipt has to show who, when, how much, and what business purpose. So the only thing is not why, right, but what. Everybody cool on meals mm -hmm. and mileage? Well, you guys are easy. Um, so we talked about Form 1040, Schedule C. Yes? Meals. Does the tip include it in the percent of the tip? Yes. Now, the IRS might question it if it was a, you know, $17 hamburger and beer and you left a $100 tip. They might wonder what's going on, right? But if it's a reasonable tip, then yes, the tip is included in, in the whole deductible. Yeah, you that not to you know that. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna get there someday. <laughs> Um, all right, so if you are in business, how many of y'all are in business? Yes. Um, then not only are you subject to income tax, but if you're a sole proprietor, you're also subject to self-employment tax. That's your Medicare and Social Security, right? Once a quarter, you guys have to pay estimated taxes. Who here is paying their estimated taxes quarterly? Oh, the sales tax ones or? no, your income tax and your self-employment tax. Okay, so uh, we're going to skip to the next, the next thing uh, because um, EFTPS, all right, forgot what it stands for, electronic <laughs> funds transfer <coughs> some, some system, right? Uh, it's the IRS's way to help you guys get your estimated payments in uh, easier, right? Sign up for this. Uh, the back of the little handout, uh, I believe there's... Can't get there fast enough. Yes, uh-huh. This EFTPS right here. Sign up for that. Um, your, because you, you have to pay quarterly, 
estimated payments. Okay, so if you have, who here has worked at McDonald's or, or somewhere you got a W-2? Has that everybody worked at one point in time? Okay, when you have this W-2 job, you know that you were working for $10 an hour and you worked for five hours, but your paycheck was not $50, right? Why? Because they took out taxes. Okay, so when you have a W-2 job, they take taxes out every paycheck. When you are self-employed, when you are an independent contractor, it is your job to pay in those taxes on a quarterly basis. So, yes? What if you have a W-2 job and you have your own business? Like, do you, I mean, do you still Okay, so at your W-2 job, if you filled out form W-4 properly, then it would be taking out taxes, but it would be assumed, it, it sort of assumes that that's the only job you have, right? Mm -hmm. So you could up your taxes at your W-2 job and ignore paying quarterly, right? As long as you're paying in often enough and you pay in enough. Okay, yes, sir. So I, I have the coupon payments and I strategically didn't do it for six months yes. because of relocating here and other things that are going on that I hope and think will be a wash. You don't get a penalty for not filing it. Yes. Or you do. You have a potential for it. Potential. The IRS believes that you earn your money, your profit, evenly throughout the year, okay? Regardless of how it happens, okay? Uh, and so they expect that you're going to be paying in taxes once per quarter based on the actual revenue that you earned during that time. Now, if you have a huge variation between the quarters, there is a, an election that you can make that says I've got seasonal income and I'm going to adjust my quarterly payments for that. Okay? But it's a lot of work and it's a lot of reporting and a lot of record keeping to get all of that. Right? If you don't make quarterly payments and the IRS comes and audits and they discover that you actually earned income during that time that you didn't make payments, then they will assess penalties. And they might even assess, try to assess penalties uh, just because you skipped one. Depends on how varied your income is. Yes, ma'am. Can you also, like, is it, you could take out more out of your W-2 if you have a different job. Yeah. But if you are married to filing jointly, can your spouse do that for you? Absolutely. In fact, I do that. Uh, um, my, my husband's recording studio is a little more volatile, and uh, my CPA practice is a little bit more, well, a lot happens during tax season, and then it gets really fun in the summer when I start business coaching, because that's the exciting part, because everybody just had to pay their taxes and went, oh no, there's gotta be a better way, right? So, um, uh, but at, mine's a little bit more even across the years. So, we, we that's what we do with mine, is uh, I increase the amount that I pay in for the W-2, and uh, we ignore the amount, the, the quarterly estimated payments for him. That can work as long as uh, the W-2 earner has the higher income or, or about even, right? If, uh, if, on the other hand, you guys start earning $10 million next year and your spouse is, you know, at their W-2 job and they're earning, you know, $100,000, you're gonna have a problem. There's no way to take enough taxes out. Does that make sense? So the answer is yes. 
but. Okay, so back to the whole formula again. Income, that's all the money coming into your business for products and services that you sold, including burger, right? Plus the expenses that you had that were incurred for that business, the mileage, the white jacket, the um, taking Lisa out for margaritas, okay, at 50% deduction, plus the mileage to get there, right? That equals your taxable income. And all of that is going to be on Schedule C of your personal income tax 1040. So it's just another page, right? Um, what you want to make sure of is that your income, that's on, on line number one of Schedule C, your gross income, is equal to or greater than all of the 1099s that you receive. Okay. So we're not <clears throat> Absolutely. Your income must be equal to or greater than the 1099s that you've received. All right. So you'll get 1099s potentially from some people for doing uh, work for them. If you are a service, if you provide a product. Uh, then you probably are not going to get a 1099. But if you do get 1099s, you want to make sure that your income is greater than or equal to the total of the 1099s that you've received for that year. Yes? Like for example, a lot of the people that I do work for to be a one-time job, they need to fill out the W-2 instead. Are they doing it wrong? Should they get 1099 all along? Uh, it's so they, they probably had you fill out a W-9, or you get a W-2 from them. Okay, so a W-9 is the form that you fill out as an independent contractor and give to someone that you are going to be doing a service for, okay? Uh, and if the amount of money that you charge them is more than $600 for the entire year, then they're gonna give you a 1099 for the services that you've performed. Or they sh they're supposed to. Okay. Uh, there's also a new box, uh, well, as of last year. Uh, Lisa mentioned that so many things happened last year that to me this is still new. It's called at risk, okay? If you are a sole proprietor and you are in the uh, motive of making a profit, then all of the money that you have put into the business is at risk. In other words, if you lost the business right now, then you would be out of money and it would hurt you. Okay, so there's a, there's a box at the bottom that says, uh, is this, are you at risk or not, right? Um, I mean, think about, uh, all right, I own a, a property investment company, all right? And uh, I have a couple of people that, that invest money with me and they don't do anything in the business. They just put money in, all right? Their money is not at risk because they don't do anything in the business. You as a sole proprietor, you as an independent contractor, all of your money is at risk that is related to the business. Is everybody cool with that? There's a box that you put that Yes, in. there's a box at the bottom of the Schedule C that asks you, are you at risk? The answer is yes, as an independent contractor. Well, you would check the address box. So that would be the, the total amount of money that I took from my personal checking account and put into my business to start it up, for example? Correct. Okay. So all of that, plus all the money that you put in afterwards to, because we didn't have enough income that month to 
fake the material. I'm confused. Is it a box that you check that says, yes, I'm at risk, or is it like a, a, a box where you enter the amount of money? Right here. I know on your screen, or your little ones, it's super teeny tiny, right? It says, uh, if you have a loss, Okay, so we, we talked a lot about profit today, right? But a loss is where you had more expenses than you had income, which by the way, is okay for a time, right? Mm, five years after that, the IRS is gonna ask, are you really trying to make a profit or not? Right, uh, because you know, five years is enough time to try and do enough advertising with the white jacket, right? Um, so if you had a loss, if then you have to say all of the invest investment was at risk, okay? Or some of the investment is not at risk. If you are a sole proprietor in the, in the context in which we've described, right? Where you are an independent contractor, you are an artist, and you are putting yourself out there to make a profit with your product or service, then you would select 32A, all investment is at risk. Everybody cool with that? I know, forgive me, covering this, but what if you don't get a 1099 of a project, or, and you know how much you got paid? Uh-huh. That's. That's exactly like cash under the table. You still have to claim it. No, I know, but like, what if you don't, what if they don't send you? It's irrelevant. What okay. they do, they, they, they should have. Yeah, they but you, sometimes, oh, in a lot of time. <laughs> 1099s tend to like not always. Yes, I, I completely yeah. agree. And it's uh, their bad, they okay. should have, if, if you um, uh, charge them more than $600, right? Uh, and if they didn't do their obligation properly, you can try and report them to the IRS if you'd like, but that seems like, you know, or you can send them to Lisa's 1099 class, <laughs> right? And uh, have them properly fill out a 1099, okay? Um, do you, so like, let's just say, you know, they don't, you know, get anything from them, but you just want to report the income. Uh -huh. Is that that's okay. proper and okay. good? Yeah, because sometimes, yeah, you don't need a 1099. Okay. Yes. On that form? Yes. That's Schedule C. Is that the box seven that you said you put the gross income? Um, okay, so you put, uh, Put your gross income, the, the uh, all of the money that you received, uh, you put that in box one, okay. and seven is just the addition of all of uh, these boxes, five and six. Cool. Uh, all right. So uh, we talked briefly uh, about um, hobbies, right? I just want to reiterate that you should be in the uh, mindset of doing what? Making a profit. You guys learn so well. Um, and in order to like sort of prove to the IRS that you are a legitimate business and you are in uh, you know in it to make a profit, uh, again having a DBA or a limited liability company, an LLC, helps solidify that a little bit, makes you look a little bit more businessy. Um, having a business plan and or a budget shows good faith that you're trying to make a profit. Um, never, ever, ever, never commingle the funds. Always have two separate bank accounts, always have two separate credit cards. Uh, and uh, keeping your accounting records straight and accurate and up to date, okay? also shows that you're legitimately trying to run a business, right? Because as a, hob as a hobbyist, right, uh, I'm just gonna enjoy doing the uh, craft, right? But as a business owner, I understand that there's more to it than just doing it, right? And again, 
you intend to make a profit. Okay, guys, it is eight o'clock straight up. Uh, I can talk about 1099s if you like. I can shut up and say, read this on your own. 1099s are due January 31st, so it's almost too late. In some of the cases, because you are a business, you should be giving other people 1099s, right? Your assistant or uh, if you hired Lisa, right, as your CPA, then you might have to give me a, C, a, a 1099. Um, uh, so I highly recommend doing them online. Don't, don't hand me them. Okay, you just answered my question, thank you. Oh, I am so good. <laughs> um, this yearly credit lend, if you use that code, MG1, uh, you'll get a discount. It's a, it, it costs about uh, $3.99 or $4.99 per $10.99 that you have to file. Uh, but believe me, by the time, if you do it, if you can do it, first of all, you have to have the right form. You can't just download it, okay? Uh, you have to have the right form. You can get it from Office Depot or the IRS will give it to you for free, but it takes forever and ever. Um, and if you're going to do it, I recommend uh, that you go down to the post office every day for you, not a problem for me. I never go to the post office, right? Um, and, uh, and send it certified to each of the people. So by the time that you spend the time to do that, pay for the certified mail, have the envelope, get the form, it's still gonna be three to four dollars, right? So you might as well just do it online in your jammies, right? Um, are, are you recommending that? I, I wasn't planning on doing any for the ones under 600. Under 600, don't touch them. It's sort of as a solid to them. Uh, it doesn't, so yeah. you can file 1099s for everybody. You're required only to file 1099s for uh, services over that that were rendered to you as a business uh, that you paid six hundred dollars or more over the course of the whole year and they are not a corporation that's the gist it gets a little more complicated but that's the gist the only exception is rent <coughs> Maybe this is complicated, maybe it's simple, but if you hire a friend for $600, that $600 is then something that you can count as an expense. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Which is why the IRS wants you to give them a 1099, because they need to count that as income. Right. And the IRS wants to know about it. How can you not, um, this is a clarification question, when I was making your ball gown, I, oh, yes. <laughs> and it's gorgeous. Thank you. Uh, so I have $500 in supplies, and then you said my time was an expense. Uh, when you're calculating your book profit, I recommend calculating also an expense for your time. When you're calculating your tax profit, your time doesn't count. So I can you explain to me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I want you guys to make not just a tax profit, okay? Uh, but I want you to actually be extremely successful in your business, all right? And in order to do that, you have to take into consideration money that you need to take out of the business, right? And as a sole proprietor, you don't have a paycheck like you do as a W-2 person, okay? So what you have to do is you have to say, here was my income, here's my expenses, the materials, okay? This is my tax profit, all right? This is how much I'm gonna have to pay taxes on, right? And out of that, after the taxes, that's what I get to live on, okay? I want that to, Think about, okay, if I had to pay someone else, how much would I have to pay them per hour to do what I do, all right? And sometimes that's a really hard question, 
especially if you don't have a really good group of, uh, of people around you that you can like bounce ideas off of, marketing and advertising and pricing, okay? So that has to include, this part down here is how you get to pay yourself, so to speak, right? And so I want not only for you to be able to pay yourself a, a reasonable, solid hourly rate, right? I want you to have money beyond that, okay? Because I want you to be able to reinvest in the company. I want you to be able to spend more on marketing so that you can get more customers. I want you to be able to hire an assistant because you have so much work, right? The only way to do that is to make sure that you pay attention to your hourly rate, or at least the project rate, right? Uh, so for your taxes, as a sole proprietor, your hours don't count. Doesn't matter how many hours you work or don't work, but from running your business, they should count. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, if, if I pay someone in a year's time $500, uh -huh. it doesn't qualify to send them a uh, that's right. That's right. Uh, does the IRS still deduct that from my as, as an expense? Yes. Okay. Yes, you still get to take the expense. You're just not obligated to send them a 1099. All right. Uh, again, I can stick around. The new W9 form. Uh, I want to make sure that you guys fill it out properly. So please look at it. Line one says this is my tax. The name of my tax form. That's going to be your individual name. For me, that would be Lisa A. Swetanovich. Okay? And I would put my social security number down here, and I would select this box here, individual sole proprietor LLC, single member. Okay? Don't, now I can still put my business name, okay? But let, let's take my husband's uh, uh, studio, right? So he would put Milan Swetanovich here, he would put Minya Sound LLC here. He would still select this, and he would still put his social security number here. I've been using my EIN number for yep, that's social wrong. security identity theft purposes. You can't. And the IRS is going to start coming back on you. So do so do the do the social security. Yes. Do not email this. If, if a company asks you for it, you hand it to them in person, you can fax it, because that's old enough technology that hackers don't care about it anymore. Uh, you can mail it, you can send it over a secure portal, you do not email it, because it has your social security number. All right, so now you guys know how to fill them out properly which means that if you get one from somebody, your $500 guy, you can help him fill it out properly, right? I have seen so many people this year fill it out wrong. Well, they, well, they give me either their name here and an EIN down there, or worse, they'll give me the name of their company up here and they'll fill out both those, their social and their EIN. Okay. Only use the EIN if you're like an S corp or something else. If you are a corporation, so then you would use the EIN. Not a solo LLC. Correct. All right, guys, that is the official end. Yes, the end. All right. Please fill out.